myself dr k kasturi devi working as assistant professor in the department of veterinary pharmacology and toxicology so today the topic of my presentation is dewormers that are used in sheep and goat their types efficacy and resistance the presence of internal parasites or worms in the gut is a common problem in pastured sheep and goat sheep and goat are more susceptible species to the internal parasites why because because of their close grazing nature especially in the case of sheep and in case of goats because of their slow process of developing the immunity and also temporary loss of immunity at the time of parturition so these are all the contributing factors for this species for development of more prone to the internal parasites and also the presence of the worm burden in these animals will drastically impact their production and as well as the economics from the farm will be dropping down occurrence of the internal parasites in these animals it can they can steal the nutrients that are provided to the host and which can impact the production of the animals so the production is drastically impacted when the animal is affected with the worms the production in terms of body weights or growth rate or in terms of milk meat production or wool production or feed efficiency conversion ratios will be drastically affected in case of worm burden animals presence of worms in the animals will make the host animal susceptible to the diseases and in case of severity of the infection is more means it can also result in mortality of the animals and sheep and goat are the most commonly affected animals when compared to the cattle why because of the close grazing nature these species are more prone for the parasites in, a, in addition to this production decrease in, in the worm and worm burden animals the farmer is also has to bear the treatment expenses which is the more economical burden to the farmer and some of these parasites are also having the zoonotic importance which is having the public health hazard consumption of the meat that is contaminated with these internal parasites can also affect the health of the humans so in these terms the these parasites are affecting the health production and economics of the farm so what are the common worms or the parasites that can harbor these small ruminants so in case of internal parasites which are divided into three important classes such as nematodes which are commonly called as round worms trematodes which are commonly referred as the flukes cestodes which are called as the tape worms the common nematodes that occur in these small ruminants that are sheep and goat are hemongous contortus and this hemongous contortus is the most widely reported gastrointestinal nematode in sheep and goat which is commonly referred as barber's pole worm or blood sucking nematode or wire worm and other in addition to this worm other nematodes such as trichuris ovis strongylus species trichostrongylus or the common nematodes that occur in the sheep and goat species coming to the flukes the common fluke that occur is fasciola gigantica which is commonly termed as the liver fluke paranthistromum species which is referred as a rumen fluke that which harbors in the rumen of the animal cystosomal species which is referred as the blood fluke and coming to the cestodes that commonly harbor sheep and goat includes monizia expansa which is the tape worm that occur in sheep and goat echinococcus granulosus that causes hydatidosis in sheep cysticercus ovis which causes sheep measles disease in the animals so these are the common nematodes that occur in the sheep and goat so what are the strategies that are available in in the presence of whenever there is occurrence of worm burden in the animals so what are the main strategies that are available for the farmer or for the veterinarian to combat these infections so the two main strategies that are available are application of the dewormers the term dewormer it is indicating that these are the drugs which are used to act against the worms so that's why we call them as the dewormers or in other ways since these parasites are kept under the classes helmen parasites so these drugs they are also referred as the anti helminthic drugs means these are the drugs which act against the helmen parasites and these dewormers based on their mechanism of targeting the parasite they are further categorized into two types like vermicidal and vermifuge so vermicidal means this class of drugs or this group of drugs are able to kill the parasite whereas vermifuge means this group of drugs they will paralyze the internal parasite instead of killing them 
this group of drugs they will cause the paralyzing or paralysis the parasite so that the parasite cannot have the grip to hold the host so this, these are the two major areas where the drugs can act so based on the effect produced by these drugs the commonly used drugs are can be categorized into drugs which can cause energy depletion of the parasite or drugs which can impair the neuromuscular coordination so some of the drugs such as benzimidazoles niclosamides rapoxamide chlorsulon clozantol oxyclozonide so this group of drugs though they belong to different classes but they majorly affect the energy reserves that are present in the parasite so we can consider them as the group of drugs which will kill the parasite by depleting the energy that is present in the parasite and there are certain group of drugs which can uh, act on the parasite by impairing its muscular coordination so these parasites when they are present in the gastrointestinal tract of the host animal they need certain support to hold the muscles of the animal so until unless they harbor they uh, they attach they firmly attach to the muscles of these animals they cannot hold or they cannot stabilize their location so when these drugs are administered what they do they will cause incoordination in their neuromuscular activity of the parasite so because of the incoordination of this neuromuscular activity the parasite will lose its grip to hold the host intestine or host muscles so in this way this paralyzed worm which is losing its grip on the intestine can be removed from the host intestine by the natural movements of the gut so group of drugs which can impair the neuromuscular coordination of the parasite includes drugs such as ivermectin levamisole pyrantal morantal and praziquantel so these are the commonly used drugs in the sheep and goat so in other ways chemical classification means so basing on the chemistry the drugs these anti helminthic drugs or dewormer drugs they are in different classes in case of benzimidazoles so which are uh, because of their nature chemical nature they are present in white crystalline color so that's why this group of benzimidazole group of drugs they are commonly referred as white dewormers and the examples of the dewormers that are present in this class of benzimidazole are drugs such as albendazole fenbendazole oxfendazole mebendazole there are many drugs and this benzimidazole is the first anti helminthic class of synthetic anti helminthic drug that was introduced to act against this helminth parasites and because of the indiscriminate uses of this class of drugs there are always uh, reports of high prevalence of resistance against these drugs so many of the parasites are showing resistance to this class of drugs and second class of dewormer is macrocyclic lactones so this macrocyclic lactones which are also referred as macrolides so examples of the various drugs that come under this class of drugs is drugs such as ivermectin doramectin moxidectin so among these drugs the ivermectin is most commonly used and also least effective because of its indiscriminate uses of this particular drug even though it is having the activity against the parasites but it has lost its effectiveness because of the development of resistance in the parasites to these drugs it has become least effective and another drug in the same class of macrocyclic lactones that is moxidectin so this moxidectin so even though Uh, this particular drug is uh, resistance is reported but the cases are less because of the less usage less frequency of uses of this particular drug so when compared to the ivermectin so moxidectin is having the less reports of resistance but all this class of ivermectin doramectin and moxidectin they share the same target mechanism of action and next class of dewormer is imidazothiazoles and the drugs which are coming under this class of imidazothiazoles include drugs such as levamisole tetramisole and butamisole and in the field level it is reported that there is low to moderate level of resistance to this class of drugs and next coming to tetrahydropyrimidines and examples under this class is drugs such as pyrantal and morantal and in the field level same so resistance is low to moderate level and coming to piperazines examples under the class of piperazines includes drugs such as piperazine and 
diethyl carbamazine and isoquinolone example under this class of isoquinolone is praziquantel and next is salicylamide example is niclosamide so these are the different classes like benzimidazoles macrocyclic lactones imidazothiazoles tetrahydropyrimidines piperazines isoquinolones under the isoquinolones praziquantel salicylamides under the niclosamide so these are the drugs which are available for us to handle the parasites or worm burden in the forms so coming to the individual class of drugs so first one is benzimidazoles so benzimidazoles are the first class of synthetic drugs that are introduced to act against the helmin parasites and they are having the broad spectrum of activity the term broad spectrum is indicating that this class of drugs they are having their activity or they can show their effectiveness against the three classes of the helmin parasites that is they are effective against the anti nematodal drugs anti trematodal drugs and to certain extent of anti cystodal drugs also and they are also having wide margin of safety so because of their wide margin of safety this group of drugs or the drugs under this class are widely used in veterinary medicine so examples are drugs such as thiabendazole albendazole fenbendazole triclabendazole and flubendazole so majorly this group of drugs they are nitrogenous heterocycles and chemically these are nitrogenous heterocycles and these two triclabendazole and flubendazole so chemically these two drugs they are halogenated benzimidazole group of drugs triclabendazole and flubendazole they are having the halogen in their structure so that's why they are considered as halogenated benzimidazoles whereas the thiabendazole so it is the only benzimidazole benzimidazole drug that is having sulfur in its structure and in addition to this benzimidazole pro drugs are also available so examples under the benzimidazole pro drugs are febental and netobimin mechanism of action so these benzimidazoles whenever they are administered so they can cause selective degeneration of the intestinal and tegmental microtubules so these microtubules that are present in the cell they are essential for the cell to maintain the structure or integrity or they are helpful for the internal transportation of the molecules but what happens when benzimidazoles are given these benzimidazoles they can cause selective action or selectively they can target the intestinal and tegmental microtubule structures that are present in the intestine parasites so usually these microtubules they exist as dimers so the dimer will be consisting of two units one is alpha tubulin and beta tubulin so during the process of polymerization this alpha tubulin and beta tubulin they together they form a dimer and form a microtubulin structure and this polymerized microtubulin structure will give support to the cell structure or it is essential for maintaining the integrity of the cell wall or these structures are also essential for internal transportation of the essential molecules of the parasite but in presence of these benzimidazoles it is binding with the beta tubulin of the parasite so by binding exclusively with the beta tubulin of the parasite it is preventing the formation of the microtubulin structure so thereby the benzimidazole is able to disrupt or damage the integrity of the parasite cell structure and can interfere in the intracellular transportation of the essential molecules and also for the uptake of the glucose molecules so this is one way of targeting the parasite by the benzimidazole group of drugs and next method is this benzimidazole group of drugs they are also able to disrupt the energy metabolism in the parasite so how the mammalians they depend upon the mitochondrial aerobic pathway of atp generation the parasites they depend upon the anaerobic pathway of glucose metabolism so for this process the compound fumarate has to be converted into succinate and this succinate formation requires an enzyme called as fumarate reductase so in the presence of fumarate reductase the succinate is formed and this succinate is further utilized for the metabolic pathways that are involved in the generation of atp molecules but what happens in the presence of benzimidazoles this benzimidazoles they can selectively inhibit the fumarate reductase enzyme and because of the inhibition of this particular enzyme there is no atp production in the parasite so benzimidazoles can act by 
inhibiting the polymerization of the tubulins and second way is by disrupting the energy metabolism of the parasite and the most important thing is it is always advised to administer the second dose of benzimidazole after the 12 hours of deworming so why because in case of benzimidazole the efficiency of a drug is depending upon the contact time of the drug molecule with the parasite so rather than the dose which is unlike seen in other classes of drugs in case of benzimidazole group of drugs the contact time for which the drug is binding or drug is available with the parasite is more important to show its efficacy so that's why in case of the parasites so whenever we are interfering the energy metabolic pathways these parasites are so clever so whenever there is inhibition of energy production in the parasites they try to survive on the reserve energy levels so they will try to maintain their survival basing on the reserve energy levels so but what happens when you are administering the second dose of drug so even the reserve energy levels are also fallen down which is resulting in complete depletion of the energy in the parasite so that's why especially in the drug molecules such as that belong to the benzimidazole group of drugs it is always essential to administer the second dose of drug after a period of 12 hours of administration of first dose so in this way we can maintain the amount of drug molecule that is being in contact with the parasite so this is especially important in case of benzimidazole class of drugs that is about the mechanism of action so these are the drugs that are discussed in the benzimidazole that is thiabendazole so thiabendazole is the first benzimidazole antihelminthic drug which is having sulfur in its structure so it is having broad spectrum of activity against the nematodes and in addition to the nematodes this thiabendazole is also effective against the parasites such as fungi and mites and in addition to this anti parasitic activity thiabendazole is also having anti inflammatory anti pyretic and analgesic activities and thiabendazole is safe during administration of the pregnant animals and next is albendazole so albendazole is the widely used broad spectrum anti helminthic drug in benzimidazole and it is effective against nematodes tapeworms and trematodes and also it is having activity against the larval stages and ovicidal in nature and this albendazole so upon administration in the body it is being converted into active metabolite that is albendazole sulfoxide so both albendazole and albendazole sulfoxide both are having the anti helminthic effect and important thing is albendazole should not be administered in the first trimester of pregnant animals so because of this ability to damage the fetus or ability to cause the teratogenic effects albendazole is contraindicated in the pregnant animals and another important thing is as i mentioned that albendazole upon oral administration it is being converted into active metabolite that is albendazole sulfoxide so this albendazole sulfoxide in the body it will be existing in the form of enantiomers and this particular form of albendazole enantiomer is having the longer levels or longer persistence levels in the blood plasma and also higher concentrations of this albendazole sulfoxide enantiomer are available in the target parasite or in the target tissues where the parasite will harbor and it is also having the more nematocidal activity when compared to the negative albendazole sulfoxide enantiomer so these are the advantages or these are the plus additive effects that we can see in case of positive albendazole sulfoxide enantiomer when compared to the negative albendazole sulfoxide so positive is having the longer persistence in the plasma so longer persistence in the plasma means it is indicating the drug is available for more duration in the body which is the essential feature and high amount of this particular metabolite are reaching the target parasites means more amount of drug is available for the parasite to act as the nematocidal activity and next drug under this class is fenbendazole so fenbendazole is also broad spectrum benzimidazole and it is also active against the worms that occur in farm animals companion animals and zoo animals and fenbendazole like in case of albendazole fenbendazole also upon oral administration it is metabolized into active metabolite 
and the acto metabolite that is generated here is oxpendazole so this oxpendazole is nothing but it is chemically fenbendazole sulfoxide so fenbendazole sulfoxide which is also referred as oxpendazole so both fenbendazole and oxpendazole both are having the anti helminthic action means both can show the activity against the helminth parasites and unlike in case of albendazole fenbendazole is safe in pregnant animals next coming to the benzimidazole pro drugs so the meaning of the pro drugs means pro drugs are the drugs which are inactive in the as such parental drug is inactive form and these pro drugs when they are administered into the body in the body during the process of metabolism they get converted into active metabolites the parent drug is inactive state whereas the metabolite that is formed is active means it is having the anti helminthic properties and examples for the benzimidazole pro drugs are febentel and netobimin this febentel upon administration in the body it is converted into active metabolites that is fenbendazole and oxybendazole and whereas netobimin upon oral administration it is being metabolized into albendazole so both since metabolites that are formed are again fenbendazole and albendazole mechanism of anti helminthic activity is similar they also act by blocking the beta tubulin polymerization and prevent the fumarate reductase function so there way they will prevent the glucose formation or glucose utilization by the worms so in both the cases the worm will be starved until it is died and in case of netobimin since the metabolite that is formed is albendazole so that's why netobimin is not safe in case of pregnant animals since albendazole is contraindicated and the metabolite formed upon administration of netobimin is also albendazole hence netobimin is contraindicated in pregnant animals and it is also effective against the larval stages and as well as the adult stages of the parasite and next coming to the second class of anti helminthic drugs that is macrolides which are also called as macrocyclic lactones so these macrolides again is consisting of two groups of drugs one is avermectins and milbemycins so the drugs which we will commonly used under avermectins are ivermectin abamectin doramectin and silamectin so this group of avermectins they are isolated from in a soil microorganism called as streptomyces evermetilis so ivermectin is the most commonly used drug in the, the class of evermectins and under the milpemycin the most commonly used drug is moxitectin and this class of drugs are highly potent and they are effective against both internal nematodes and as well as external arthropods so since their ability to kill both internal parasite as well as the external parasite so we will refer them as the endectocyte means it is able to kill the parasite that is present within the body as well as the parasite that is harboring outside the body so that's why we will use for this class of drugs as macrolides as endectocytes so coming to its mechanism of action so this avermectins and milbemycins both will are able to bind with glutamate gated chloride ion channels these glutamate gated chloride ion channels are specially found in the parasites such as nematodes and arthropods so this is one of the drug safety feature so because of the selective action of macrolides targeting the glutamate gated chloride ion channels which is specifically found in the nematodes and arthropods so what happens upon activation of this glutamate gated chloride ion channel so by binding with this glutamate gated ion channels so these glutamate receptors they are present on the post synaptic neuron so this is the picture of synaptic neurons so this is the pre synaptic neuron and this is the post synaptic neuron and this glutamate which is synthesized by the pre synaptic neuron is released into the synaptic cleft and binds with the glutamate gated chloride ion channel receptors so what happens when glutamate is binding with this receptor it is promoting the entry of chloride ions so nothing but it is in a ligand gated 
chloride ion channel receptor here the ligand is glutamate neurotransmitter so binding of the glutamate with this receptor is promoting the entry of chloride ions into the neurons so entry of chloride ions again is indicating that entry of negative charge into the neuron so more entry of chloride ions it causes the hyperpolarization of the neurons so this is the normal process that is occurring but what happens in the presence of macrolides so these macrolides they are having the allosteric binding site on the glutamate gated receptor allosteric binding site means instead of binding at the site that is designed for the glutamate they will bind at the other site on the same receptor they will bind at the other site so that condition we will refer as allosteric binding site so in the presence of macrolides they bind with this glutamate gated receptors and cause opening of the gate so opening of the gate is facilitating the entry of chloride ions and causing hyperpolarization of the neurons so when once the neuron is continuously hyperpolarized there is obstruction to the neuronal conduction when there is no neuronal conduction it will result in classic paralysis of the parasite so in the presence of macrolides due to activation of the glutamate gated chloride ion channels which is resulting in increased influx of chloride ions and causing hyperpolarization which is resulting in classic paralysis of the parasite so ivermectin so this is the first commercially available macrolide antihelminthic and it is also not only first commercially available it is the most widely used endecticide in the veterinary medicine and it is effective against the strongylides ascarids bots and roundworms and it is also having significant ectoparasitical activity against the ectoparasites such as lice mites cattle grubs and not only it can is able to kill both the internal and external parasites and this ivermectin is also able to kill the existing infection and also it can prevent the entry of infection so because of its high lipophilic in nature the drug can remain in the body for longer duration so because of this property it not only kills the existing infection but is also able to arrest the entry of future infections it means that it is having the efficacy or activity for longer duration and major route of administration of ivermectin is subcutaneous route and this route favors the longer bio, sorry higher bioavailability of the drug and it is also having long terminal elimination half life of the drug so elimination half life means it is the time that is required for the elimination of 50% of drug from the body so long terminal elimination half life means the drug is taking longer duration to get eliminate from the body so longer elimination means the drug is residing more duration in the body so which is more desirable for the drug to act against the parasite so next coming to the another class of drugs that is imidazothiazoles and examples under the class of imidazothiazoles are drugs such as tetramizole levamizole and butamizole so tetramizole so tetramizole will be existing in the form of two optical isomers the two optical isomers of the tetramizole are levoform and dextroform so the optical isomers of the tetramizole are levoform and dextroform and where the levoform is only having the antihelminthic activity and whereas the dextroform or dextro isomer is contributing for the toxicity associated with the tetramizole so keeping in view of the antihelminthic activity that is associated with only the levoform they have synthesized the levoform in the and given the name as levamizole that is nothing but the levo isomer of the tetramizole since dextro is having the toxic nature so they have removed the dextro isomer and they have synthesized only the levo isomer of the tetramizole so that's what we term as we call it as the levamizole so here this is the slide that is representing the mechanism of action of various drugs that can affect the neuromuscular coordination so in the earlier slide we have discussed that there are certain classes of drugs which can affect the neuromuscular coordination in the parasites since what is the importance so already the importance of neuromuscular coordination for a internal parasite to hold the intestine of the 
first is much ascension. If the grip is lost, means it can be expelled by the host movements. Host intestinal propulsion movements can help in expulsion of the worm. So there are certain drugs which can affect this particular neuromuscular coordination. So here these lines, these oblique lines are indicating the muscular fiber and this side of the muscle is representing the stimulatory neurons and whereas this side we are representing the inhibitory neurons. So easy way to understand is stimulation of the stimulatory neurons. Whenever the stimulatory neurons are activated, it will result in spastic paralysis. Means the paralysis is before the incidence of paralysis, there is a moment of continuous spasms. So that's why we will refer it as the spastic paralysis. Whereas activation of inhibitory group of neurons will result in flaccid paralysis. So there is placidity of placidity upon the paralysis. Before the paralysis, there is placidity of the muscles. So we can now discuss about the drugs which can act upon the stimulatory neurons and are able to cause the spastic paralysis. So under that first one is levamisole. So this levamisole is considered as ganglionic stimulant. So because of its ability to act on the ganglions, so activation of these stimulatory neurons will promote the release of acetylcholine. So release of acetylcholine at this neuromuscular junction will causes the activation of the nicotinic receptors. So activation of the nicotinic receptors on the muscles will cause continuous contractions. So this release of acetylcholine from the stimulatory neurons which are in turn stimulated by the activated ganglion can be brought by the drugs such as levamisole. Likewise, there are another group of drugs which can act as cholinergic agonists. So examples are parental and morental. So this parental and morental which will be coming under the class of tetrahydropyrimidines. So which we will be discussing in the later slides. So this class of drugs, they are also having the ability to interact with the nicotinic receptors that are present on the neuromuscular junction. So why they are able to interact with the nicotinic receptors means this parental and morental, they are chemically, sorry, they are biologically, they can mimic the action of acetylcholine. So this acetylcholine, whenever it is released, it is able to stimulate the cholinergic receptors. What are cholinergic receptors? Nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. So activation of nicotinic receptors at neuromuscular junctions will cause the continuous contractions. So this parental and morental, which are of biologically, they can mimic the action of acetylcholine. They can bind with the nicotinic receptors that are present at the neuromuscular junction, will cause continuous activation of these receptors and causes the spastic paralysis of the parasite. Before discussing about the inhibitory neurons, there are certain neurotransmitters which are called as the inhibitory neurotransmitters. So example, best example is GABA. So presence of GABA, Whenever GABA is released, it will cause the influx of chloride ion channels. So again, the story, influx of chloride ion channels means again, it causes hyperpolarization and flaccidity. So there are drugs which can potentiate the release of GABA from the inhibitory neurons. So those drugs are ivermectin and piperazines. So these particular drugs, they cause flaccid paralysis by initiating the release of GABA from the inhibitory neurons. So these are, in a nutshell, these are the drugs which can affect the neuromuscular coordination either by stimulating the stimulatory neurons or by stimulating the inhibitory neurons. So this is about the levamisole. So levamisole, as I mentioned earlier, that it can act as autonomic ganglionic stimulant. So stimulation of autonomic ganglionic ganglions means it can cause activation of both sympathetic as well as the parasympathetic nervous system. But activation at the neuromuscular junction will result in enhancing in the activity of nicotinic-like effects. And these nicotinic-like effects are nothing but spastic muscular paralysis. So this is the main mechanism of action in case of levamisole. So in addition to this, levamisole can also interfere with the carbohydrate metabolism by blocking the enzyme that is fumarate reductase and succinate oxidase enzymes, which are essential to take part in the energy, ATP synthesis of energy molecules. 
and also the levomazole is also having the immunomodulatory effect so under the recommended doses levomazole can enhance the cell mediated immunity of the host but when the dose is high it can also act as a immunosuppressive only at the recommended doses it can enhance the immune responses of the host that whereas at the toxic doses it will act as immunosuppressor and it is also effective against the adult and larval roundworms lungworms ascaris and timonchus species and another important feature is levomazole is not recommended or contraindicated in horses and iv route of administration is also not recommended in case of levomazole and toxicity in case of levomazole so while going through this uh, articles we have, have seen that there is a case report in sheep form in mathura so which is having the which has seen the levomazole toxicity due to over dosage so during the process of drenching they have accidentally given the excess dose of levomazole in the animals so where the affected animals have shown the stimulation of hyperesthesia or increase in the paralytic activity so this particular case was successfully treated by administering of the atropin sulfate okay and in addition to this atropin sulfate the specific antidote in case of levomazole overdosage is hexamethonium which is the ganglionic blocker is the specific antidote in case of levomazole overdosage and also there are certain adverse drug reaction interactions this levomazole like unlike other classes of drugs it should not be combined with the drugs which are also having the effects on the nicotinic receptors so drugs such as pyrantal morantal diethyl carbamazine these these drugs are also having the ability to act on the nicotinic receptors so co administration of both levomazole and classes of drugs which are also affecting the nicotinic receptors is contraindicated because it can have the additive toxic effects and likewise organophosphorus compounds which are having the excessive cholinergic signs and combination of levomazole with tetramazole is also not indicated because tetramazole is also itself is con containing the levomazole so combination of levomazole with tetramazole will causes the additive toxic effects that are associated with the levomazole so these are certain precautions that are to be taken in case of levomazole toxicity so next coming to the another class of drug that is tetrahydropyrimidines so this tetrahydropyrimidines these are also the derivatives of imidazole-thiazole group of drugs which are having the broad spectrum of anti-helminthic activity and examples pyrantal morantal and oxantol so in the earlier slide itself i have mentioned that this pyrantal and morantal they are also having the nicotinic like effect they cause nicotine like depolarizing of the neuromuscular blocking effects so they can induce the continuous contractions and spastic paralysis of the parasites and paralyzed parasites can be slowly expelled from the host and it is effective against the adults as well as in case of larval gastrointestinal nematodes and these are also active against the strong ailes ascarids pinworms and hookworms and they can be safely administered in pregnant animals also so next coming to the another drug that is praziquantel so this praziquantel which is an isoquinolone derivative which is a broad spectrum having activity against cystodes as well as the trematodes so it is having effectiveness against both cystodal parasites as well as the trematodal parasites and it is also effective against all species of tapeworms and effective against the all stages that is larval stage young stage and adult stage of tapeworms and is also safe anti cystode in case of pregnant animals and coming to its mechanism of action so praziquantel can induce rapid influx of calcium ions into the parasite so what happens when praziquantel is administered presence of praziquantel can cause influx or draws the calcium ions into the parasite so excess entry of the calcium ions into the parasite will cause or induces instantaneous contractions of the parasite followed by spastic paralysis of the parasite so this instantaneous contractions and spastic paralysis of the parasites is induced by the excess amount of the calcium that is storing in the pharyngeal muscles of the parasite 
and also high doses of the praziquantel can also induce damage to the parasite tegument so these cestoid worms they are usually having their external covering as the tegument so this tegument is the one of the protective barrier for the tapeworms but what happens in the higher doses of the praziquantel it is able to damage or it is able to destroy the parasite tegument and because of the damage to the tegument the parasite is susceptible to the digestive action of the host juices so where the digest uh, where the host enzymes host proteolytic enzymes can effectively act on the parasite because of the lack of proper tegument protection on the parasite and next is salicylates so examples under the salicylate group of antihelminthic drugs includes drugs such as clozenctol rifoxanide and oxycloxanide so this class of drugs they are also broad spectrum against the antisestoids and trematodes so these are effective against the cestoidal parasites and trematodal parasites and also effective against or acts on larval stage young stage and adult stage of tapeworms and in case of flukes they are effective against the immature flukes and adult flukes so coming to the mode of action of this salicylates so these salicylates they act by uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation so this paras uh, this group of drugs they act by uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation so what do you mean by oxidative phosphorylation so oxidative phosphorylation is the pathway that occurs in the mitochondria that is essential for the electron transportation chain to occur and for the synthesis of atp molecules so during the process of this oxidative phosphorylation what happens the electrons which are generated from this nadh and fadh system they are transported to the to the protein complexes which are designated as 1 2 3 and 4 so during the process of oxidative phosphorylation the electrons which are generated from either nadh or fadh they are transported to the protein complexes which are designated as 1 2 3 and 4 along with this electron transportation the protons which are present in the matrix of the mitochondria they are pumped into the space between the inner and outer mitochondrial space the protons which are present in the matrix of the mitochondria they are pumped into the space that is present between the outer and inner mitochondrial membrane so this proton pumping or this proton driven force is essential process or essential for the successful oxidative phosphorylation pathway but what happens in the presence of drugs such as salicylates that is clozenctol oxycloxanide or rifoxanide or niclozamide so this particular group of drugs they carry a detachable proton in its structure so in their structure they carry an a detachable proton so clozenctol oxycloxanide and rifoxanide they carry a detachable proton in its structure and that particular detachable proton in the presence of these drugs can cross the mitochondrial membrane and can reach the matrix of the mitochondria so again since the proton is again reaching into the matrix of the mitochondria this this proton gradient is unable to be maintained so due to lack of this proton gradient it is resulting in uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation pathway so thereby there is decrease in the synthesis of energy molecules such as atp and also they act by inhibition of glucose transportation so these drugs they not only cause uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation they also inhibit the uptake of glucose so in both ways they are inhibiting the parasite to take the energy molecules which is resulting in starvation of the parasite until it get died and next is clozulon so this clozulon it is in a benzene sulfonamide group of drug so this clozulon which is effective against the flukes that is trematodes so in the trematodes this clozulon acts by inhibiting the enzyme that is phosphoglycerate kinase so this particular phosphoglycerate kinase enzyme is essential for 
glycolysis, which is the energy metabolic pathway. So inhibition of the enzyme phosphoglycerate kinase enzyme is interrupting the glycolysis. So these flukes, they majorly depend or the major source of energy in the case of flukes is glycolysis. So because of the interruption of this glycolytic pathway, it is, uh, these flukes are starved to death. And next drug is triclobendazole, is a halogenated benzimidazole. So unlike the other drugs which we have discussed in the benzimidazole class, this spe uh, special feature of this halogenated benzimidazole is they are having the excellent activity against the juvenile flukes. So juvenile flukes from the age, this dr particular drug is effective against the flukes which are of one week age. So the importance of this triclobendazole is this particular drug is able to arrest or kill the flukes, immature juvenile flukes. This particular immature flukes are the, the migratory, these are under the migratory phase. So during the phase of the migratory in the liver, they will cause the extensive tissue damage of the host. So this particular drug is able to arrest the juvenile flukes. And the mechanism of action is similar to the other benzimidazoles, like are inhibiting the polymerization of the beta jubilins as well as inhibition of the fumarate reductase enzyme. And another drug is diamphenitide. So this diamphenitide, so it is also effective against the immature flux, but it is effective only this diamphenitide, the uh, special feature of this particular drug that is diamphenitide is, it is exceptionally effective only in case of early immature flukes. That is the flukes which are ranging between the age of day one to six weeks of age. So why? Because this particular drug that is diamphenitide, this diamphenitide, the parent drug is not having any action on the flukes. But Upon administration, this diamphenitide, after being entered into the liver, so after reaching into the liver, this particular diamphenitide undergoes metabolic changes by deacylation pathway. So this particular deacylation pathway, which happens only in the liver, and the metabolites which are generated during this deacylation pathway, they are only having the action against the flukes. So since this and, and these metabolites are generated only in the liver, it is effective only against the immature flukes which are present in the liver. So before the phase of migration, these flukes which are present in the liver are only susceptible to the action of the diamphenitide action. So that's why this particular drug diamphenitide is also preferred as prophylaxis in the treatment of facial acid treatment. So these are some of the anti-helminthic combinations which are used in the veterinary practice. So combinations such as ivermectin and chlorsulone, so which is used against roundworms and adult flukes. So similarly, thiabendazole and rifoxanide combination, which is used against roundworms and adult flukes. And combination of levomizole with oxyclozonide with minerals such as cobalt and selenium. So this combination can help not only to fight against the infection of roundworm and adult flux, but also helping the animal to cope up with the trace element deficiency. Means we are also inputting the nutritional requirement for the animal to show resilience to fight against the infection. And also combinations such as rifoxanide with oxybendazole with cobalt and morantol in combination with diethyl carbamazine against the roundworms and lungworm, lungworm infection. But what are the precautions that are to be considered when we are approaching for the anti-helminthic drug combinations which are belonging to two different classes? If the ready-made commercial preparation is not available in the market, but you are intended to deworm the form with the combination of deworming drugs which are available individually. In that conditions, if the precautions that are to be considered are do not mix the dewormers which are not chemically compatible. So compounds which are not chemically compatible will not show any profitable effect. So that's why do not mix the dewormers which are not chemically compatible in nature. And compounding of the medications only should be done under the supervision of veterinarians. And we have to purchase and administer each drug separately. 
that is administration of each drug should be done separately by using separate syringes so these particular drugs they should not be administered in the common syringe also we have to administer by using two separate syringes and administer each drug at a full dose since we are combining two drugs we should not decrease the dose of recommended administer each drug at the full recommended dose one drug can be given immediately after the another drug and another important thing is observation of the withdrawal periods so when we are going for the combination of deworming we have to follow the withdrawal period of the deworming drug which is having the longest withdrawal period so whatever the drug which is having among the two drugs which is having the longest withdrawal period that particular withdrawal period has to be followed for example one drug is having then withdrawal period of 7 days and the drug is having then withdrawal period of 14 days then we have to follow the withdrawal period of longest withdrawal period that is we have to follow the 14 day period of withdrawal so next is coming to how can you know the effectiveness of the dewormer that we have used in the form how can you know so the like effectiveness of the dewormer that we have used in a form can be determined by fecal egg counting technique so fecal egg counting technique is the technique where the feces is evaluated like how many number of eggs are present before the treatment and after treatment and this fecal egg counting technique is having numerous advantages in case of estimation of the or in the study of the internal parasites like what kind of infection when you are examining the feces of the animal it helps in determination of what kind of infection and what is the load of infection so based on the load of infection again we can select the animal under the treatment or not kind of infection load of infection or like another thing is like checking the effectiveness when once the deworming has done for checking the effectiveness of the dewormer that is used so again we have to sort for the technique that is fecal egg counting technique how can we evaluate the results of this fecal egg counting reduction test so this according to the fecal egg counting reduction test which is basing on the percentage of eggs that are reduced up during the treatment so if there is more than 95% of the infection or 95% of the eggs are reduced during the part of treatment then we consider it as the effective treatment so if then the uh, when the percent of reduction is more than 95% then we can say that there is no evidence of resistance to the particular deworming drug which we have used for animal but if the uh, fecal egg count reduction rate is between the 90 to 95% means there is reduced efficacy against the drug and also there is chance for suspecting the resistance in the parasite towards the drug we have administered and if it is ranging between 80 to 90% it also indicating the reduced efficacy with more uh, like uh, resistance is likely and if the fecal egg count reduction uh, test uh, it is indicating the less than 80% reduction so it is indicating that the particular drug which we have used is ineffective and the worm has resistance towards the drug which we have used for the deworming so next is coming to the alternatives so what are the various alternatives apart from the synthetic based drugs what are the various alternatives that are available to control these internal parasites so first option is plant based alternatives so there are certain plants which are having the anti helminthic properties so examples kamala or rotulera so this particular compound is obtained from the glands of the fruit of plant called malotus philippensis so this glands are the fruit this particular fruit they contain the phytochemicals called as rotulerin and isorotulerin so these particular active constituents are able to cause tinea fuse effect means that is they are able to paralyze the testodes and similarly ericolin so ericolin which is obtained from the ripened seeds of erica catechu that is betel nuts so these are also effective against the tapeworms so ericolin also call can is able to cause transient paralysis of the worms and the paralyzed worms can be expelled by the host intestinal peristaltic movements so when the when once the parasite or worm is losing grip in the intestine 
with, with the help of the host peristaltic movements, the worm can be expelled. And the other plants which are also known to have the anti-helminthic properties are examples such as pumpkin seeds, papaya seeds, stem bark of plant that is Punica granatum, that is pomegranates, seeds of Butea monosperma, essential oil that is obtained from Nizella sativa and Piper longum, seeds of Cucurbita maxima, and plants such as Aza directa indica and Ananosquamoso. These are some of the few examples of the plant sources which are having the anti-helminthic properties. But the thing is, these natural anti-helminthics, even though they are having the anti-helminthic nature, by relying on these, we cannot completely eradicate the worm burden in the animals or in the flock. But usage of these plant sources can help in reducing the number of animals that require the synthetic treatment. They only can help in reducing the animals that require or animals that rely or the animals that demand the treatment or uses of the deworming drugs. And another approach is usage of nematode trapping fungi. So it was identified that the chlamydios, sorry, chlamydospores of the fungi called Duddington, uh, sorry, Duddingtonia flagrans. The chlamydospores are the spores that are obtained from the fungi called Duddingtonia flagrans. So when they are or when they are fed to the calves at different doses, they have observed that those dependent effect of the ability of the fungi that has germinated is able to trap the uh, nematode that is present in the feces. So actually these spores, they are orally fed to the cows. So these cows, this particular, in this particular study, they have observed that these cows which are having the natural anti-helminthic infection. So these particular animals, they are fed with the spores of three different doses. So these spores which have passed all along the feces, they have germinated in the feces and they form a trapping against the nematodes. So these four pores are forming, this fungi, this grown fungi is forming a trapping structure and capturing the nematode and preventing its growth. So in that way, by administration of the fungi, they are able to arrest the uh, nematodes that are present in the feces. So in one way, we can break the life cycle of the parasite. So by usage of the fungal spores that are obtained from the Duddington tonia flagrans, so which is also referred as nematode trapping fungi. So because of the ability of the fungi to trap or to capture the nematode parasite and arrest its growth, so this particular fungi is also referred as nematode trapping fungi. And another thing is and uh, usage of, so this is also recently introduced concept of administration of copper oxide wire particles. So usage of this copper oxide wire particles are also known to improve the efficacy of the dewormers. So these copper oxide wire particles which are available in the form of tiny metal rods, so where they slowly release the copper. So because of the slow release in nature, there is the risk of toxicity is also low. And they are able to reduce the hemonchus contactus, that is barber pole worm infection in sheep and goats. So in nutshell, in order to overall to control the internal parasites in a sheep form, we have to depending uh, we have to depend upon multiple factors. So first thing is promoting the zero grazing or confining the grazing of the animals. And next is proper uses or judicious uses of the deworming drugs following proper biosecurity measures such as quarantining the newly introduced animals only after ruling out that animal is free from the worm burden and selective treatment, browsing, so promoting the browsing, the animals which are promoted for the browsing of grazing. So they have the minimal amount of the internal parasites. They can have the chances of infection from the ground level of the parasites from the grazing is can be reduced and also before proceeding for the treatment testing for the presence of anti-helminthic resistance following of good managemental practices such as rotation of pasture strategic deworming managing grazing height so as i said that these worms they can crawl up to one to two inches from the 
ground. So preventing the close grazing nature of the sheep and goat can also reduce the parasitic infestation into the animals and promoting mixed species grazing and provision of clean pastures. So frequent, uh, so before proceeding for the deworming or before proceeding for the treatment, so going for the fecal account determination and nutritional supplements and genetic selection of the resistant breeds. So all these factors, they can contribute or they can help in controlling the occurrence of internal parasites in small ruminants such as sheep and goats. And these are the doses of the commonly used drugs which are used in sheep and goat. 